Hello, my dear comrades, and welcome back to Ushanka Show. Здравствуйте, дорогие товарищи. В эфире программа Ушанка Show. My name is Sergei, and I was born in the USSR. Меня зовут Сергей, и я родился в Советском Союзе. So some time ago I recorded a video about this interesting uh, conversation that my brother Artyom, who lives in Kiev, Ukraine, uh, had with his taxi driver. Most of that conversation was about uh, Kiev taxi drivers back in the Soviet days and how they were making extra cash. But also the guy told the story about his uncle, who worked back in the 70s and 80s at the Kiev uh, jewelry factory, Kievsky Yuvelirny Zavod. And of course, the topic of the conversation was about how those guys uh, figure out how to make extra money while working at the jewelry shop. And it's time to learn some new Russian words. Actually, we're going to learn another Soviet word, Soviet terminology. Подработка. Подработка. So this is what we call different side jobs that you could do at your main place of work. So you do your job that you're getting paid, then you do little side jobs that you make extra money that you pocket. Подработка. Well, of course, you say it's easy to have подработка if you deal with gold, silver, and precious stones, right? But interestingly enough, uh, those guys, they weren't stealing gold and silver. In fact, it was very hard to do because it was a quieter, uh, a lot of control and oversight, but also that was extremely dangerous because, you know, it doesn't take much at because gold is so expensive, and you're getting yourself into the хищение госимущества в крупных размерах. So that's a stealing state property in large quantities, and it's like 15 years, 20 years in prison, up to being shot. So that was way too risky, way too dangerous. So in this case, подработка was actually using equipment that was available at the jewelry shop, and bringing its own, their own gold to make different items. They had smelters to melt gold or silver. They had presses. They had engraving equipment. They had polishing equipment. Everything you need to make Russian Orthodox gold and silver crosses. Yes, we have this uh, quite an interesting situation place in you know like russia ukraine belarus we had millions of russian orthodox people uh, they may didn't go to church every day but one of the things that uh, we do we carry around our neck a chain and a cross a small golden or silver cross so when you get baptized quietly not officially you get in a little cross so there was quite a huge demand for these little silver golden crosses, and, but no one manufactured them since government had its anti-religious policies. So that was a huge opportunity to people who had access to uh, jewelry equipment to make those crosses and make huge profit. So they would buy gold or silver from private people, or they can buy golden wedding rings, or uh, golden coins from the Tsar era, or quite often they'll purchase awards like Orden Lenina or other ones that contain gold, and then they take it into the factory, they will smelt it, clean it, and do all the stuff and start making crosses. For example, Orden Lenina, one of the highest awards in the Soviet Union, contained 28 gram of gold. That's a lot of gold. But of course, it was quite a dangerous thing to uh, trade this award because you can get in serious trouble with authorities. But otherwise, besides that type of risk, uh, such подработка had huge margins because you use someone else's equipment, so there's no amortization, no rent, uh, no electric bills, 
nor any other kinds of bills. You just come quietly, use equipment uh, in the, during the breaks, then you give another guy who will do an engraving, another guy who will polish, and then you sell it and make huge profit. But what was uh, kind of funny, sad and funny, but this is, you know, those uh, unexpected side effects of uh, life uh, during the socialism, is that people made really good money, but they have a problem where to spend the money. They knew they that Oberhaisess, which was a department that dealt with the theft of the state property, that Oberhaisess is probably watching all the workers. So they were afraid to buy outright a car because then those guys will show up and start asking questions. If you're making 150 rubles a month, how come? After two years at work, you found 9,000 rubles to purchase Lada. So those poor bastards were prajigat dingi. There's expressions so pretty much like burning your money. They would take a taxi to work and back from work. They were drinking a lot, uh, spending money in restaurants, on expensive food items, uh, going to Black Sea every summer, maybe a couple of times. So pretty much burning cash and because they knew that they could get searched anytime. Once again, if they find a lot of money, they'll need to find explanation where they got cash from. In Soviet Russia, money spent you. And actually, I just remember another story that uh, someone told me, also a, a driver, uh, that he used to make really good money using equipment uh, to sew jeans. So there was a college where they teach you how to make clothing and at night they use that high-end equipment to make jeans. So they had the Vietnamese uh, students uh, bring in from Vietnam uh, fabric, so jeans fabric, cotton and hardware. So they were making fake Levi's and fake Lee jeans and really good quality and then reselling them and of course also burning all the money that they made that way. But you know, a kind of similar idea, uh, you do your podrabotka using uh, government owned equipment and you uh, fulfill that demand that state owned factories can't fulfill. And actually, if you read my book, American Diaries 1995, I mentioned there, uh, once again, similar story. I call it heavy metal. It's when I was looking to buy some barbells when I wanted to start working out. And I found the uh, advertisement for custom weights. I called, I made the arrangement, and I went and actually the address was a factory. And the guy told me to walk along the fence and there'll be a hole in the fence. And that's why he passed me through that hole, those custom made weights that he made on the factory equipment, maybe even using factory metal. And I just paid him cash. And then of course it was the whole struggle uh, dragging those. It was a 30 kilograms each, those uh, barbels. And I had to drag them all the way across. Uh, the city back to my apartment. That was quite an adventure. Well, comrades, that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed the story about Soviet Padrabotka and maybe learn something new. As always, don't forget to like this video and share with your friends. I'll talk to you soon. До свидания. Goodbye.
Hey, by the way, the cool merch for cool comrades is available at the Ushanka store at teespring.com. Just a friendly reminder that my book American Diaries is available on Amazon.com or shoot me an email if you would like to have a signed copy. Thank you! And if you love my channel and would like to show your support, please click on the link below this video and become the patron of the Ushanka Show. For as little as one dollar you can help us grow and create the new interesting videos about the life in Soviet Union.